Ukraine, like Germany, like much of the rest of Europe, has a history of medieval conversions to Christianity. It has a history of medieval urban law, which was continued through the Grand Duchy of Lithuania into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It has a history of the Renaissance. The, the Kiev Mohyla Academy um, is the oldest, uh, oldest institute of higher education in the East Slavic lands. When this part of Ukraine was incorporated by the Russian Empire, it was the largest educational institution in the Russian Empire. Um, Kiev, Rus, Ukraine has a history of reformation of Protestants and Catholics, but also, of course, of Orthodox. It has a history of three-sided, or even more complicated, <coughs> reformation. The Jewish history of Ukraine is perhaps the richest history um, in all of Jewish history. The only possible competitor is Poland. Um, the whole history of the Shtetlach, the whole history of the Jewish town, was built in Ukraine. Jewish history, which is of course a central part of European history, makes no sense without Ukraine. <clears throat> Ukraine had wars of religion beginning in 1648, just as the wars of religion in Central Europe stopped. And of course Ukraine also has a history of national ideas and national movements. What I'm trying to say before I speak of the wars and the suffering of the 20th century is that there are many chapters of Ukrainian history, all of which will be familiar to any German, any European with the, with the most basic of historical education, and some of which are extraordinarily interesting. So while I'm going to be speaking mainly of the history of the Great War, of the Second World War, of the reasons why Germans might want to feel a sense of responsibility for Ukraine, I also want to emphasize that there's a brighter and, a, and perhaps a more interesting history of Ukraine. That it, in, a, in a better moment, when we didn't have to be concerned with the war that is taking place now in southeastern Ukraine, we might be reading about medieval or renaissance or reformation Ukraine. That the history of Europe itself is enriched by this country. Or to put it a different way, insofar as Germany is better than everyone else at carrying on historical discussions, it can only be the case that adding Ukraine to European history will make these discussions more interesting. This is not just a matter of informing policy, it's simply a matter of culture générale. It's thing, these are things that every European should, and I'm confident at some point will, know. That said, the moment when Ukrainian history does start to be exceptional is the beginning of the 20th century. Not because there are no national movements, there are, the Ukrainian national movement goes back to the 1820s and 1830s. It goes back to Romanticism, the same as the German national movement does. In the 19th century, there is a fairly broad Ukrainian national movement. During the First World War, far more people die for Ukrainian independence than die for the independence of pretty much any other East European state. The fact that it's not achieved changes our perspective, right? Because we think of history in national terms. So the fact that there is no Ukrainian state after the First World War means that we forget about the history of Ukraine during the First World War. And what I'd like to stress in the next couple of minutes is that the experience of the First World War on the territories of today's Ukraine was excruciatingly intense. It contained many of the moments which would be familiar to you, but also a whole series of other events. Now, as I say, there was a national movement in Ukraine. It was much like the Czech national movement. When empires fell apart, the national movement tried to form a state. Um, the reasons why this national movement failed have to do with the, 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 the large number of very powerful projects that surround Ukraine. But let me give you the chronology. The First World War begins with the Russian Empire advancing into the Habsburg monarchy. As it advances into the Habsburg monarchy, where is it advancing? Into Galicia, into the territory that's now Western Ukraine. And what does it do? It expropriates the Jews who live there, who in the Habsburg monarchy could own, could own property. In 1915, the Russian army is driven back. What does it do then? It deports tens of thousands of Jews from the territory of today's Ukraine, um, which was then, of course, the territory of the Russian Empire. In 1917 and 1918, we have the Russian Revolution, which for Ukraine is a moment where, um, where Ukrainian independence is, is declared. But it is also, of course, the moment at the beginning of the Russian Civil War. Now, from the point of view of these territories, the Western Russian Empire, Ukraine, also Belarus, the Baltic States, the Russian Civil War is like the First World War all over again. 
The, the First World War is over in the West. It continues with a similar scale and rate of killing for another several years in Ukraine, in the Western Russian Empire. And this war that we call the Russian Civil War, correctly, because it's in the Russian Empire, takes place largely in Ukraine, largely in southern Ukraine. And a huge number of the casualties, military and civilian, are inside Ukraine. So inside Ukraine, in 1918, 1919, you have a, a revolution and a counter-revolution, a war between the Red Army and the counter-revolutionary army known as the White Army. You simultaneously have a Ukrainian national army trying to, fight, trying to found a Ukrainian national state, fighting at one time or another against both of these armies. So you have a three-sided civil war. During this three-sided civil war, pogroms are committed against Jews by all three sides, although predominantly by the Ukrainian national army. When the Red Army defeats the White Army um, and defeats the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian army then allies with Poland in 1919. And Poland and Ukraine together defeat the Red Army, which is the last time the Red Army will be defeated until Afghanistan. Right? In, 19, in 1919, 1920, the Polish army, with Ukrainian allies, which is often forgotten, defeat the Red Army, first at Warsaw, and then drive the Red Army back. Now, this is an extraordinarily important <coughs> moment. I'm not going to try to make it more dramatic for you than it needs to be, but you might remember that where the Red Army was going after Warsaw was, was Berlin. So if there's anyone who thinks that that wasn't a good idea, um, you might remember that the trail of the Red Army um, westward is littered not just with Polish but with Ukrainian corpses. Ukrainians are buried in Polish cemeteries all the way to Warsaw because the Ukrainian army was then fighting the Red Army just like the Polish army was. What this brings though is not a clear national victory. So in general in Eastern Europe, whether you won a war or lost a war did not decide whether you got national independence. It had almost nothing to do with it. It was basically a matter of chance. Um, the Ukrainians were involved in winning this war against the Bolsheviks, but they're not rewarded with national independence. Instead, the territory of today's Ukraine is divided mainly into two pieces. Most of it becomes a Soviet Ukraine. The western part becomes part of Poland. This is the Treaty of Riga of 1921. Now, why is this so interesting and important? It's interesting and important for a couple of reasons. The first is that this means that the Soviet Union is established as a state with a boundary as opposed to being an international revolution. The second reason this is important is that everyone at this moment acknowledges that there's a Ukrainian nation. This is what I find so interesting. It's very strange to be a historian in 2015 and listen to people deny the existence of a Ukrainian nation. Whereas a hundred years before, even the Bolsheviks were perfectly aware that there was a Ukrainian nation. They had just been defeated by a Ukrainian army on the battlefield. They were perfectly aware there was a Ukrainian nation. And that is why the Soviet Union was established as a federation of nations, right? That's why it's not an international revolution, but why there's a Ukrainian republic in the West of the Soviet Union. Because everyone at the time, Lenin, Stalin, you name it, knew that there was a Ukrainian nation. Even Josef Wolt, who was then reporting um, from Ukraine, wrote to people in Berlin articles saying, and I quote, Ukraine is a nation that certainly deserves its own state. Now, being part of the Soviet Union was of course not the same thing as being an independent nation state. To put the matter very simply, what it meant was that the Ukrainian territory of the Soviet Union, this western territory, this very sensitive territory, this borderland territory from Moscow's point of view, was at the center of the Soviet effort to modernize, at the center of the Soviet effort to prepare for war. And although these are not strictly speaking wars, I'm going to mention them because they're related to war. There is the war against the Kulak in the early 1930s, the attempt to prepare the Soviet Union for conflict with the capitalist world, which is particularly painful in Ukraine. Ukraine is regarded as strategically sensitive, but it's also the place in the Soviet Union, along with southern Russia, that produces the most food. And therefore, when agriculture is collectivized, Ukraine suffers the most, and more than three million people starve unnecessarily. The second round of preparation for war, the Great Terror of 1937 and 1938, leads to the execution of some 700,000 Soviet citizens. I would emphasize all across the Soviet Union, 
but disproportionately in Ukraine. Ukrainian people who live in Soviet Ukraine are more likely to die in the terror of 1937 and 1938 than anyone else. And when the war comes, and these are the main remarks and the ones with which I'll close, when the war comes in 1941, Ukraine is at the center in three different ways. The center of the Second World War, of course, is the German-Soviet War, um, the War of 1941. And Ukraine is in the center of that in three different ways. The first, and this may be the most important part, is you can correct me, but I think this is the part which is most often forgotten in Germany. Ukraine is at the center of German war planning. From the point of view of Hitler, the whole point of the Second World War was to win Lebensraum. And what Lebensraum meant was, above all things, Ukraine. Ukraine was going to be the territory which made Germany autarkical, which allowed Germany to become a world power, which would allow Germans to pur purify themselves as a race, but also sustain themselves as a people into the indefinite future. Lebensraum meant Ukraine, which meant that Ukraine was treated as a colony. Hitler spoke of Ukrainians as people who could be pacified by giving them, I'm quoting now, a few beads as one gives to colonial peoples. Hitler said that once Ukraine was conquered, all that Germany would have to do was put up loudspeakers on poles in each village and play music on Saturdays and Ukrainians would dance around the poles and therefore be happy. The image was a purely colonial one. The second way that Ukraine is at the center of this war is in um, the way the war was actually carried out. All of the territory of today's Ukraine was occupied by German and allied forces for a good deal of the war. By comparison, only 5% of the territory of today's Russia, 5% was occupied. The totality of Ukraine was occupied for much of the war. In absolute terms, the civilian fatalities in Ukraine were probably greater than civilian fatalities in Russia. In, ab in relative terms, they were hugely greater than the fatalities in, in Russia. And of course, these fatalities include the Holocaust, right? The center of the Holocaust next to Poland is Ukraine. And insofar as there is German discussion and sense of responsibility for the Holocaust as an event, this must concern these inhabitants of Ukraine as well. The third way that Ukraine is at the center of the Second World War has to do with its end, that is, with the victory of the Red Army. The victory over the Wehrmacht is largely the credit of the Red Army, which took most of the casualties and inflicted most of the casualties. But of course, the thing to remember is the Red Army was a Soviet army, and fighting on the Western Front, it was a disproportionately Ukrainian army, because as it took horrible losses, it recruited from the territories where it was, right? The, the southern part of the, of the campaign of the Soviet forces were called the Ukrainian Front, not because the army was made up of ethnic Ukrainians, but because that's where the war was taking place, in Ukraine and in Belarus, until, of course, it reached Eastern Europe. So one is aware in Germany that Germany was liberated by the French, the British, the Americans. One is not aware that more Ukrainians died fighting the Wehrmacht than Americans, by far. More Ukrainians died fighting the Wehrmacht than the British, by far. More Ukrainians died fighting the Wehrmacht than the French, by far. More Ukrainians died fighting against the Wehrmacht than the British, the French, and the Americans combined. Combined. Um, as far as I know, no one in this country has pointed this out during these debates about historical responsibility, and it seems to me to be relevant, which is not to take away from the achievement of the Red Army as such, nor from the Russians, who were the only people who died in greater numbers on the battlefield than the Ukrainians. It is to point out that the Soviet army was an international force, which included a very large number of Ukrainians. Now, when we, when we keep these things in mind, then we, can, we, we, we have a chance um, to come clear about one thing which I'd like to be very explicit about. There are such things as historical mistakes. There are interpretations that differ. There are things that are mistakes. And one mistake is to say Russian and mean Soviet, and to say Soviet and mean Russian. That is simply a mistake, and one that is made too often in this country. If one wants to talk about Soviet institutions, one uses the word Soviet. If you're going to switch over to national terms and use the word Russian, that then means Russian. And if you're using national terms, you have to also use the national term Ukrainian and Belarusian. 
Saying Soviet and meaning Russian, or saying Russian and meaning Soviet is simply a mistake. It's like saying Austrian and meaning German or something. It's simply a mistake, right? That's a mistake you wouldn't make, right? That's a mistake you wouldn't make. And interestingly, you would feel guilty about it, right? Okay, um, so you should feel guilty about any other kinds of Anschlusses confused as well. Um, so um, where, where I'm leading you with this is, is, um, a, very, is a very simple point. The point, and this is now just a suggestion, is that there is a blind spot in the German historical debate in all of the ways that the Germans have taken responsibility, which for me are <laughs> exemplary, right? Which for me are exemplary. The historical strife is why I became a historian. The attempt of Germans to take responsibility and to consider the past is in many ways exemplary. But there is a big blind spot, and that blind spot is precisely in Ukraine. And I worry that it's more than a blind spot. I worry that there is a tradition of colonial thinking about Ukraine, which it, until it is recognized as such, cannot be overcome. The temptation to say, there's no country, there's no language, there's no state, there's no history, that's a colonial temptation. And when the idea of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is revived, as it has been from Russia in fall and in spring, as you all know, that is an invitation to a colonial discussion, right? The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is an invitation to a colonial discussion between Russia and Germany. That's one way of talking about the past. I would like to think that here in Germany and in Europe in general, we have found a better way to talk about the past. And I hope in the 15 minutes that I've been given to you, I've succeeded in conveying a little bit of how I think that discussion might look. Thank you very much for your attention.